Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. A couple of weeks ago was International Women's Day, and uh, I, I saw uh, an event at a um, a fashion designer's boutique in uh, in New York that I really respect, and I've always respected. Diane von Fustenberg, I think, is her name. Uh, she was the creator of these wrap dresses that I just adore. And uh, and and someone from Toronto who uh, has got a really impressive uh, job attended this session and wrote about it. Uh, and so I thought it'd be interesting to check in with her and find out a little bit about you know what uh, Diane von Fustenberg and some of the other panelists had to say, and and whether she bought a wrap dress and <laughs> uh, and you know all that kind of stuff. So I want to introduce you uh, tonight to Anastasia. Tertziganis, is that correct? Tertziganis? You got it, Brian. You got Excellent. it. <laughs> and uh, and I really, you know, I'm I'm, I'm interested in, in chatting with you because Anastasia Tertziganis is impressive on her own right. She is a luxury retail enthusiast and a digital product manager at Canada Goose. Canada Goose being really quite an iconic Canadian brand. And she shares with us tonight her time at the DVF uh, Diane van Fustenberg Woman in Charge event in celebration of International Women's Day and Women's History Month. And we're going to discuss... Uh, Diane Van Fustenberg's mission to propel women forward and highlight the incredible women who are on the front lines of change. And I think it'd be helpful if we just took a second, uh, and Anastasia was helpful uh, in in uh, giving me this uh, this back uh, background, uh, a little bit of information about Diane Van Fustenberg before we get started. Diane Van Fustenberg is a fashion designer, founder, and a chairperson of her namesake brand, DVF. In 1974, she created the iconic wrap dress, a symbol of power and independence for women all over the world. DBF is now a global luxury fashion brand celebrated for its effortless glamour and its powerful connection to generations of women. Through the DVF uh, uh, hashtag in charge movement, Diane and her team are inspiring female leaders around the world to own their story and find their agency in business, love, and life. Find their agency. That's interesting. Correct. Find, find your agency. agency. <laughs> Anastasia, you know, you're a Canada goose, which is all about the, the big coat. Uh, the big jacket. Why are you such a fan of Diane von Fustenberg and wrap dresses? Definitely. Well, my love for Diane von Fustenberg stems back from when I was in high school, actually, oddly enough. Um, and going back, you know, reminiscing, um, when I was about 17 years old, I actually fell very sick, unfortunately. Um, and while I was sick in bed, I was home from school and I was watching what was the spinoff of The Hills. If you remember Lauren Conrad, The Hills, you know, height in the early 2000s. Um, but it was called The City. And in The City, you know, the star of the show, Whitney Port, she had an internship working at Diane von Furstenberg in New York. And it was um, a quote that Diane stated, which really resonated with me. And um, ultimately, which kind of helped me find that power to, you know, get well um, and, and, and to carry on, uh, you know, heading into university right afterwards, which is such a, a milestone in everyone's life. But her quote was, the most important relationship is the relationship that you have with yourself. Really? That's interesting. And yes. And the every most other important relationship, relationship is the relationship mm -hmm. you have with yourself. Correct. And <clears throat> it, it, it's a reminder to really be, you know, um, an advocate for yourself and, and to really, you know, find, find that agency to lead your life with authenticity, um, to very vouch for, for what, what you want to become in life. And um, yeah, that's kind of where it all started. Um, and how many wrap dresses do you have? I have a couple. <laughs> I do have a few. And my love for the wrap dress really, I mean, it's about comfort. It's about style. So when we talk about the wrap dress, it's a dress with no buttons, no zippers, and it's made out of jersey material. So What's it flatters every single. So jersey material, it's a super soft cotton, um, almost kind of like a, it, it's a thin flowy material that drapes so perfectly on a woman's body. And with the wrap, right? But it cinches in, in um, the waist. <laughs> so it really gives you that very nice hourglass shape. Um, and it's it's comfortable. So you can walk into an office, you can wear this fabulous wrap dress. You look great and you feel great. So I've always thought, I'm a fan of wrap dresses, I have to admit, I've always thought that they're very professional looking, but also very sexy at the same time. Is that exactly appropriate comment to make or not? 
Oh, for sure. For sure. And actually, so the history of the dress back in 1974, when Diane first created the wrap dress, it actually became a power, um, sorry, a symbol of power and independence for, for all women of all body shapes. And within its first two years, it sold 5 million wrap dresses. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. And now today we see the wrap dress, you know, first started in the 70s during, you know, the height of women's liberation, but it's still carried on and still worn by, you know, royals such as Kate Middleton, Princess of Wales, to even American royalty like Oprah Winfrey and former First Lady Michelle Obama, and now everyday women like myself. Now, why were you intrigued about this uh, Women in Charge event and why do you want to attend it? Yes. So one of the things I... I really selfishly, I really wanted to meet Diane <laughs> in, in real life and, you know, get to shake her hand and greet her. But it was also the lineup of panelists and conversations um, and the itinerary that really, you know, that really impressed me. Um, so again, the event took place at uh, Diane von Furstenberg's flagship store, which is located in the meatpacking district of New York. It's got this the, huge staircase. Uh, it's in- huge. It's, it's huge. So the interior complete encompasses the very essence of her brand. There's loud prints and bold colors that splash, you know, across the room from floor to ceiling. And when you walk in, you're greeted with this glass staircase that's centered right in the middle of the room. And it leads you up to what was the conference room. And you have there women from all backgrounds of all ages and all career paths who made up the audience. And then from the front, you can see, you know, Diane prepping her mic for the day to begin. Sounds like it was a very uh, impactful day on you. Oh, it was. It was. Well, we're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Anastasia in just two minutes and uh, and hear more about uh, some of the talks, some of the panelists, some of the message that's, that she got out of it, and a little bit about her story uh, with Canada Goose as well. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be back in just two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Anastasia Anastasia Tertiganis. She is uh, with Canada Goose. Uh, She has really uh, quite an interesting job. She is the luxury retail enthusiast and digital product manager. We're going to have to find out what the luxury retail enthusiast... Well, tell us, what's a a luxury (laughs) retail enthusiast? It means that I am obsessed with retail. I am obsessed with fashion and... What I do for a living, it really is my dream job. I get to create luxury digital experiences for our customers at Canada Goose. And what that could look like is, you know, creating a digital or sorry, a virtual shopping app um, to a digital kiosk in store, which you can actually experience um, in the West End of Toronto at Sherway Gardens Mall. (laughs) Uh, but yeah, it really is bringing, um, you know, the online customer to stores and vice versa and being able to create such an experience where it's memorable, it's helpful to the customer and ultimately they get to experience, you know, the beauty of the brand, which is Canadian warmth and Canadian heritage. Canadian warmth and Canadian heritage. Sounds great. We have to come back and chat a little bit more about that, but let's, let's go on to this event because March does uh, mark the celebration of women's history month, the global celebration of the social, economic, political, and cultural achievements of women throughout the month, global events have taken place to commemorate the breakthroughs and impacts that women have made to shape history and the the charge forward that they take on today to accelerate women's equality, uh, that we've had some great conversations uh, about um, uh, Women's International Day. Uh, and Anastasia, as I mentioned, went to this event uh, at Diane von Fustenberg's uh, studio. Uh, the event was called Women in Charge Event. Uh, and... Uh, and 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 Anna, and Anastasia, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about the event, um, who the panelists were that presented, and and just give us sort of a a picture of what the day was like, if you could. You walked in and you saw this big glass staircase and <laughs> and Diane Van Fruisterberg at the mic. What happened? Yes. So Diane kicked off the day and she has this very worldly feel to her. Um, You know, she's been in the industry for decades and she's been her brand and and what she's been able to do has really um, 
like it, it really re- resonates with, with different generations of women. So the panelist lineup reflected that and the conversations that were had were incredible. The energy in the room was absolutely contagious. Um, the event started with a mindful meditation led by Deepak Chopra, which oh that in itself was, you know, uh, it, it was incredible. Um, and it was hosted and emceed by the hilarious and witty Michelle Buteau, who is a creator, writer, and star of the upcoming Netflix series, Survival of the Thickest. So we had laughs all day. The the crowd Survival laughed. Survival of cried. the Thickest? Th- Survival of the Thickest, yes. <laughs> And again, her 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 series, um, it really is again embracing who you are, loving yourself and your body, and not letting that that stop you in terms of achieving your goals. And some of the other panelists. So the day featured six panel discussions that took place. Um, so I'll quickly just run through the six, just so everyone has an idea. Sure. Um, but Great. the first panel discussion featured Amy Griffin, who was the founding partner of G9 Ventures, Kim Pham, co-founder of Omsom, and Dennis Wood. Denise Woodward, who is the founder and CEO of Partick Foods. And the discussion was about female entrepreneurship and female investors, how more female investors are trying to get involved in the startup space. And funny enough, how female run startups are actually statistically more profitable in the seeding phase than male led startups, really? which was, was interesting. Yes. I was, I was, it's interesting. I was at the uh, Toronto region board of trade dinner uh, this past week and the winner of uh, whatever the big award was, was, uh, I don't know her name, I apologize, I should, but uh, the CEO of a company by the name of Nix, uh, which is uh, a Canadian uh, um, intimates apparel uh, company. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, yes. um, but she gave an incredibly impassioned address. And she spoke about that as well, about how um, you know female entrepreneurs really are doing extremely well, getting funded and being very successful. I thought that was really quite interesting. It is. And it's great to see. It's great to see. Um, So that panel was fantastic and was then followed by um, what was called The Power of Owning Your Story with Hama Adin, author and advisor to Secretary Hillary Clinton. How impressive is that? And Bazoma St. John, who is a marketing executive, entrepreneur, and author of The Urgent Life. And this discussion was about not letting your past shame you from continuing to pursue your dreams and actually owning your past um, as a part of your authentic self. And The Urgent Life really is about... Um, you know, we, we have su- such a, sh- a short time on, on, on this planet. We really want to make an impact with our lives. And it's about taking every chance you get to recognize the little things, to appreciate the, the, the little things, but to also, you know, say yes to yourself and go after your big dreams as well. That's interesting. Huma and Dean uh, has got an interesting story. She had a, a boyfriend or husband that got into a bunch of uh, problems. And then uh, she was found to have had a whole bunch of uh of Hillary Clinton's emails on her uh, on her laptop. Did she address that sort of past and how she dealt with it? She did. She did. So she has a a son, and um, and how how her story goes. So her husband was sent to prison, and um, you know, kids on the schoolyard, they they tease. They are they they can be mean, and um, what her advice was to her son was you know, don't like own, own your story. Yes. This is your truth. Like dad went to jail, unfortunately, but don't let that deteriorate you from again, making friends, you own up to it. John, she had a really interesting story. Um, the way that her, the urgent life kind of began was her reflection on her life and, and how her life as she felt was surrounded by death unfortunately. So from a very young age, she lost both of her grand, uh, of her grandparents. Um, in university, she then lost her boyfriend to suicide. Oh my God. And then her, her husband, which she has a four-year-old daughter with, died from cancer. So as she's reflecting, um, again, on her past, and she's a very successful marketing executive, she felt that she needed to write this book, The Urgent Life, um, to again be true to herself and to own the past um, as something that makes her stronger rather than seeing it as something that she should be shameful of. And it was very, it, it was sad, but it was also inspiring to kind of see how, 
you know, even through the stories of trials and, and, and tribulations, she still was able to, um, you know, move forward with her daughter yeah. and not let that um, kind of, you know, shadow uh, put shame on, on herself. So here you are, you know, a young um, retail enthusiast, uh, yeah, you know, uh, someone from Canada that's come down to this event. You hear Huma Adin and this person of, about urgent life, which she's gone through suicide and uh, and death and 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 loss of her parents at a young age and stuff like that. What did you take away from that? How did it impact you? What did you think about? Definitely, I like it, it made me think about again my <clears throat> my own trials and, tri- and tribulations and leading into like what makes me vulnerable, really. And seeing that everything that we try to hide and that we try to bury under the carpet, um, if anything, that should be something that we should be proud of. And it shouldn't be something that we should really shame away from, but rather owning it as a part of who we are and and as a part of our story, because that's ultimately what makes us human. And that's, I think that's interesting because I've, I've, I've long believed that everyone has a sort of a signature story um, that Mm -hmm. defines who they are. And, and, you know, you, you mentioned alluded to uh, that you had a a health issue uh, when you were a teenager and, uh, and uh, um, you ended up watching some shows that inspired Mm -hmm. you uh, with Diane Van Fusterberg. Um, often someone, you know, people either go through a death or a divorce or a, a sickness or a, a, you know, some sort of a traumatic event. And while that bad thing was bad and you don't never want to relive it, um, it actually ends up being critically, critically important in your life and, and defining, you know, who you are and who you become. Definitely. It, it becomes a part of you. Anastasia, I understand that there were some, uh, sessions, uh, talking about, um, AI. Tell me about what the discussion was, the panelists were that were talking about AI. Yeah, definitely. So um, Mira Maradi, who was the chief technology officer of OpenAI, was a part of the panel. And she presented on the present and future of AI and its impact to the workforce as we know it. So OpenAI, which developed Dolly, a tool that uses AI to create artwork based on prompts, and the widely popular ChatGPT, which I'm sure we've all played around with at some point. Have you? I haven't um, yet. Is it good? You have to try it out. Oh, it's really? very impressive. Yes. Okay. So ChatGPT is an artificial intelligence chatbot that can answer questions in a very human-like form through a conversational model. So you ask it a question, it gives you an answer, you can ask it to tailor it more professionally, to dumb it down for you, and it does so. And um, when we talk about AI, we're not hearing um, Mira Maradi's name enough in the space. Um, and as a woman in tech myself, I just want to like scream her name from the rooftops. Oh, really? Yes. So she's very impressive at 35 years old. She is again, the CTO of open AI. Um, one of the most, uh, I, I say one of the most used AI tools, um, today, and um, when we talk about the rise in popularity of ChatGPT, we know that the large language models will indefinitely transform the way that we do work today. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe I do. It transform I work? do. Mm-hmm. I, so what, what I think AI will do is improve our productivity and eliminate the redundant, repetitive work that we do on a daily basis. You don't think it'll eliminate all of us? It'll take over? I don't think so. I don't think so. You don't think AI will create a better Canada goose jacket than a person can create? Mm. (laughs) What I think AI can do for us is you know, it, it, it's going to help, help us collaborate, not necessarily replace us. So AI systems, you know, if we use it in a form to collaborate rather than to replace, I think that it could be a really great tool that we use to improve our processes. But ultimately, you still need that human vision and that human touch when we're talking about either creating coats, creating parkas, because there are still flaws in AI. 
it's not, it's not perfect. Yeah. And um, that's exactly what, what, what Mira kind of stated. So, you know, we, we see already that school boards in the U S in France and in India are banning the usage of chat GPT in the classrooms due to, you know, the risk of cheating plagiarism. It's almost too good. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's and, interesting because from what I understand chat GPT can lie. It doesn't know, it doesn't know the truth. It doesn't know what facts that it sources are actually true facts or false facts. Exactly. And that's that's one of the, the points that, that that Mira made was a lot of the times what the um, language model is doing, it's making assumptions. So if you ask it a question and it gives you an answer, you know, sometimes you have to ask, are you sure? Yeah. Are you sure that's that's the answer? And it will try to then, um, you know, uh, re regenerate a, a better answer for you based off of what it knows. But what it knows is what we feed it. It's what information we feed it. And based off of the user, that could be anything. Right? What did uh, what did Mira, is it Mutaki? Muradi. Muradi. What did yes. Mira Muradi say? What what was her so, what was her message that that AI was going to take over the world or what was her message because she does no. have a fascinating story <laughs> she does so she sees that the advances of AI um, it's it's more through a lens of optimism mm -hmm. and as we've seen with other revolutions uh, that we've gone through you know there will be jobs lost yes but there will also be new jobs created from the needs of changing technology yeah and um again it's more so the ability to take over repetitive work so that humans can focus on the higher level the more visionary work um meaning that ai can actually amplify our creative output well i hope you're right because i'm uh, i'm a little worried about uh, what ai is going to do and then i understand <laughs> there was another panel on artificial intimacy from artificial intelligence to artificial intim intimacy what what was that all about yes so um artificial intimacy was a a, a term coined by esther perel and esther perel is a psychotherapist known for her work in human relationships so she conducted a mini social experiment um, based on her new game, Where Should We Begin, which, which is what it's called. And it's a game to bring out the storyteller in all of us, as you know, storytellers are the building blocks of, of relationships. So she asked everyone in her um, in, in, in her social experiment, if you can receive one text message right now, what would you want it to say? And as simple as the question was, the responses were so deep and invited the audience to really see just how vulnerable and, and, and aching almost um, the world really is and how a lot of us are, you know, searching for love and, and closure in people's responses. Um, so some of the responses from that one simple question was, I wish my mom would text me good morning one last time, or I wish my ex would text me, I'm sorry for throwing away 17 years of our love. And, you know, it's it's the, these questions that kind of, you know, provoke storytelling, provoke vulnerability, um, but also helps us connect with each other. Um, so one of the things that Esther brought up was that she feels like we are in a time of social atrophy. And really, that's um, pretty uh, that's pretty dystopian almost. Yes. Yeah. So, so social atrophy and. Um, be coming out of the pandemic and coming out of a place where we were so isolated, we almost forgot how to interact with each other and we lost the power of play, right? And it's through play that we end up discovering um, and practicing curiosity and imagination. And what, what Asa really wanted to achieve through this game was to help us provoke more thought and curiosity in our relationships. And again, we see this every day, whether we're at a conference or at a coffee shop, the first question that we always ask each other is, so what do you do for a living? Yeah. Right? And we're, we're just scratching the surface. And well, it's all about what you do rather than who you are. Than who you are. Exactly. And, you know, rather than asking, you know, what do you do? Her challenge for all of us is to ask more deeper questions that help us connect on a deeper level. And that could look like, you know, questions um, like what risk did you take to get to where you are today? That opens up your story and okay, who you so, are and so. gives 
Anna, Anastasia, if you were to get one text right now, <laughs> what would you want it to be? Oh, that's a good, good question. Um, I, when, when it comes to, to, to closure, um, I, I, what, what I think is, if I could get one, one text, um, it would be, <laughs> it's so... tough, isn't it? It's tough. It's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> You know, you it's, think about the one text, what would you want to do? And uh, and then actually, I think not only admitting it to yourself, but saying it publicly um, in that room of all those people. Saying that's it publicly be, is the hardest part. That's got to be pretty vulnerable. Part. You know what? I'm yeah. not going to put you on the spot. I apologize for that. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back with Anastasia in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio while we're on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight about a event that uh, Anastasia, uh, oh my gosh, I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Tertsiganis. Uh, Tertsiganis. Tertsiganis. <laughs> I apologize. A, yes, it's a Greek last name. <laughs> it's a beautiful last name, but it's, it's uh, difficult to pronounce for me at least. Uh, you're a luxury retail enthusiast and a digital product manager at Canada Goose. And she went to a DVF, Diane von Fustenberg event. Uh, uh, a week or two ago uh, in New York uh, called Women in Charge uh, in celebration of International Women's Day and Women's History Month. Um, you know, it, it sounds like it was a really impactful day uh, on you. Um, did you did you just fly down for the day or did you uh, stay for a couple of days? No. So I ended up going for the weekend, actually. And I brought my sister along, who's also a woman in tech. And um, she has never gone to New York. She's never visited. So I saw this as an opportunity uh, for us to have a little girls trip in New York City. <laughs> and did you buy um, something uh, at uh, Diane von Fusberg store? Yes. So I ended up buying a little wrap top, actually. I felt like I had enough dresses, <laughs> but I wanted to have, you know, something a part of her, something a part of the brand and something to remind me on the event. So I came home with a little wrap top. What was it like meeting Diane von Fustenberg in person? Is this the first time you've met Diane? Uh, this is person? the first time. Yeah. So I've idolized her for many years and meeting Diane in real life was like meeting a rock star. Um, at the end of the event, there there was just a swarm of girls trying to get up on stage with her to take a photo after the event. And she had this very like worldly monk like calmness to her. So, you know, nothing, nothing bothered her. Nothing could have phased her. Um, but she was so kind and had such great uh, humility to her. Um, she was willing to take a photo with everyone, which was great. And when she saw me in the crowd, she grabbed my hand, pulled me towards her and was just so gracious. Um, and again, I, I, I was able to say that I met my idol. Wonderful. And so she's not like uh, uh, that character Merle Streep played in Devil's Wear Prada. No, no. I would say that she's the total opposite, actually. She's still, she is a boss woman. And, um, you know, she still is assertive and attentive to her team, but she's authentic to herself. And I think that means, you know, being able to lead with love and with grace um, and not letting, you know, the challenges of life really harden you, but if anything, allow you to, to lean into your softness as your superpower. But your softness is your superpower. Mm -hmm. Really? Yes. So with that, again, I feel like as a woman myself, re reflecting back on, on how I lead with my team, I am more soft. And that doesn't mean that I'm not a great leader. If anything, I'm I'm able to, um, you know, empathize with others and really get to understand it and, and listen to their needs and be able to tailor the, my approach to to what they need. Um, so yes, you know, in the in the workplace we can be assertive. A uh, woman can take charge, as this whole event was about. But also, it really is about being your your authentic, true self, whatever that means. And if you're someone who, you know, likes likes to play up the more softer side and lead with that compassion and lead with that love, right? It's not to say that you should bury it in order to compete with everyone else, um, but really to hone in on it and to use that as your superpower. The the title of the conference in charge. 
doesn't seem like soft power. It seems like tough, hard power. Like what does in charge mean then? So to me, in charge means taking agency over your life. And as we said before, this word agency, um, and it really means advocating for yourself, championing yourself and loving yourself through all the growing pains, um, all while being authentic to you and to your values. Um, and, you know, this, this reminds me of, of why I fight uh, for my career and my in my personal life and it's because I'm worth it. Right. And, um, you know, whether it be through, uh, you know, asking for a raise or a promotion or even walking away from a relationship that no longer serves you being in charge really means figuring out what you want and acting on it. Don't sit on the sidelines of your life. Take action. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, you know, you've got this line about agency and I, I found it kind of interesting. Um, uh, tell me a little bit more about how you find agency in business, love and life. Yes. Um, so I'll give you an example. What do you mean by agency? So, <laughs> um, agency, it, it, it's about, again, taking, taking life, um, by taking, its horns. Really? And by its horns taking life by its horns it's life is a it's a weird journey <laughs> and there are many ups and many downs um but i really think it's creating your own destiny and um you know using er using all of the challenges that you've been through as fuel to the fire to keep going and to you know to to forge your own path forward taking all of the challenges in your life and using them as fuel. How is it fuel? Because you learn from it or because it energizes you or, or how is it fuel? It's fuel in, in both ways, I'd say. So in one way, um, you know, it's, it's lessons and it's experiences that make you better, that make you stronger. Um, you know, without having failed, without having tried, you're not living uh, a full life. And by being able to overcome these challenges and still get up every morning and, you know, try and put yourself, um, you know, up against, up against the next challenge, you're, you're really uh, championing yourself and you're allowing yourself to try out new things. I understand that there were four in-charge commitments that uh, Dan Van Fustenberg or DVF asked you to make. Connect, expand, inspire, and advocate. Tell me about each one of those, if you could, and what, what you think they mean. Connect is just talking to other people? So connecting, um, as you know, one of the commitments of Diane von Furstenberg's In Charge movement, really is about trying to make a habit to do two things every day that benefits someone other than ourselves. So this could even be reaching out to two people every day and letting them know that you're thinking about them. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of goes into the next pillar, which is expand. And expand is all about expanding your network and your social group. And this could mean arranging a meeting or a call each week with someone that you don't know someone that you typically won't engage with, um, but someone new to help inspire you, which is the third uh, pillar. Yeah. And um, inspire and, 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 and through inspiration, it really is about sharing our experiences, our vulnerability um, and our strength through, through storytelling. Um, and then the last pillar, the fourth is advocate. So again, it's taking action on, um, matters that, uh, that, that we care about. It's rallying up, it's speaking up and organizing ourselves to make an impact. So I guess what you're doing is actually advocating today. I guess so. I, I I would say actually this whole experience, I was, I've been able to touch on, on all four pillars, um, so yeah, thank you for that. What an incredible experience. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we do need to go to these kinds of conference, these kinds of events. And I think that particularly if, if Diane Van Fustenberg was this, uh, 
this hero, this mentor, this idol that you describe, uh, having the opportunity to actually see her in person and listen to her in person, and obviously uh, the other panelists, must have been very impactful uh, on you. How do you think it's going to change what you do day in and day out going forward? I think day in and day out, when you know we think about the customer's voice, when we think about the types of journeys that we're um, you know, trying to create for their uh, experience with the brand, with Canada Goose, um, it, it's about you know, connecting with our customer, getting to really know them, understand what they truly want from our products, from the digital touch points that they take with the brand and implementing that. And how, what I like to say to, to my team is, our only true boss is the customer. And, um, you know, when we talk about, you know, how, how we should move forward and taking direction, we need to understand, um, you know, the, the, the different trends within the market. So Canada Goose is an international brand. We operate in Asia Pacific, North America, in Europe, and each voice from each region is so different. So, you know, we can't take like a blanketed approach to, to, to any of our projects. Um, it's really about trying to get in touch, expand our network <laughs> into those regions um, and really hear from, from the ground that's, that's, that's there, from the people on, on those front lines uh, to really understand who our customer is and, and how we can help them. Sounds like you uh, you had a very impactful uh, day. So uh, thank you for sharing it with us. We're going to take a break, a final break for some uh, messages and come back with some concluding comments in just two minutes with Anastasia. Stay with us, everybody. Uh, I've had a really interesting conversation tonight with uh, Anastasia Tertziganis. She's with Canada Goose. She's a digital uh, marketing expert. Um, uh, she's uh, a fashion expert, a fashion advocate. Uh, uh, as we know, uh, she's just come back from this really interesting, inspiring trip to New York where she was at uh, a Diane Fustenberg uh, event in her uh, her main store in the Flatiron District, in the Meatpacking District, actually, uh, talking about uh, women being in charge. And uh, Anastasia, I wanted to turn the tables on you a little bit and ask, what would you what would you want to say if you were one of those panelists? Uh, pretend that we're speaking right now to a whole bunch of young ladies on International Women's Day, and you want to inspire them and tell them, what do they got to do to be successful in life, to deal with life's challenges? Definitely. So what I would say, Brian, is that no dream is too big. And what I mean about that is when I first started thinking about, okay, what did I want to do? What was the type of woman I wanted to be? I always had my heart set on fashion. I knew that I wanted to work in the fashion industry um, and have some type of creative role in it. But the feedback that I got from, you know, family and loved ones at the time was, you know, it's not realistic. Working in fashion at the time was not seen as something that, you know, could be realistic. It's a, it kind of felt like a pipe dream. And um, I like to think that I went against the grain and forged my way into the industry by networking and finding out, you know, the people in the industry that uh, I inspired, that, that inspired me, um, who I thought were doing great work that I saw myself doing one day and building those connections and those relationships. So what I would say is, if you are currently not where you want to be, or if you have a dream um, that, that you feel might be too big, there's someone already doing it, <laughs> most likely. And what I would say is reach out to them, get connected. Um, you'd be surprised how many people are willing to have conversations on LinkedIn, let's say, um, and you know, gain, gain a mentor in the industry. And that's the approach that I took. And by doing that, you're almost... Um, you're, you're, you're kind of, you're learning from the best. Yes. But you also have a sponsor afterwards too. Someone who knows you, someone who understands, you know, what you want to do, how, how, how you're able to contribute to a team. And, um, that's, that's ultimately how, how I landed my role at Canada Goose. It was through a sponsor. It was through a mentor. Um, mind you, the interviewing process was very rigorous. <laughs> uh, so I did have to prove myself there. Um, but yeah, even, you know, you can apply it to fashion. You can apply it to, let's say, if you want to work in automotives or, or in tech, um, or the get life. connected. 
or life. Exactly. And it's because again, it's, everything, it's, as Esther said, everything is about relationships and, and storytelling. So you might as well, you know, start creating those relationships from a young age. Well, it's the first two pillars as well. Connect, I guess, and expand, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Anastasia, you know, this has been a real pleasure. Um, and, uh, I think that uh, you're going to be one of these people that we watch in the future as you uh, become very successful in the Canadian fashion, if not the uh, global fashion business. Uh, I look forward to following your career. Thanks for joining us and sharing with us. You know, it doesn't, not everyone will, uh, you know, pack their bags and go off to New York for a, uh, a, 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 a one day session on International Women's Day and be inspired by their idol. But those are the kinds of things that you take chances and, uh, and they can change your life and uh, exactly. inspire you. And so thank you so much for sharing uh, the story with us. Really appreciate it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Brian. That's our show for tonight. Thanks everyone else uh, for joining us. I remind you on every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online at www.saga960am.c. All my podcasts and videos are on briancrombie.com. I post them on LinkedIn and, uh, and YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and uh, everywhere. Uh, good podcasts are listed like Speakeasy and Audible and Apple. Thanks very much, everyone, for joining us. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.